Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. I want to thank you so much for being here for our second Community College Lecture Series. And uh, the topic today is Caring for the Patient with Lung Cancer with Pammy Hallward. Uh, a few preliminary pieces of information before we get started. Uh, if you need to get a hold of us for any reason, your uh, sound or the video isn't what it should be, you can reach us at unccn at unc.edu. You can also call or text us at 919-445-1000, and you, know, you, you can always reach us that way. Additionally, you can use Poll Everywhere with our polls, and we're going to show you our first poll in just a moment, and you can respond if you've got a, uh, you don't even have to have a smartphone, any phone that texts, you can go ahead and text in your answers to our questions, and at the end you'll be able to ask questions with your phone or smartphone. Uh, you can also do that through a computer, and we'll, uh, well, I say we, but Tammy will be taking your questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can check us out on the web at unccn.org. There you'll find a lot of information about our team, our newsletter, uh, all of our different events, as, as, as well as a great deal of other information, background about the organization, etc. And you'll also find all of our videos, both for this event and other events. Facebook is at facebook.com slash unccn, and on Twitter at unc underscore cn. All right. For our first question, what you're going to do is begin by texting UNCCN to 22333. So, that, so you'll, you'll text in 22333 with the letters UNCCN, UNCCN. That's what you'll text to the number 22333. And that just joins you to poll everywhere. Once you've done that, then you can go ahead and uh, answer our first question. The question is, based on estimates by the American Cancer Society, what is the average percentage of new cancer cases in 2016 that involve lung cancer in males and females? So uh, if you think that's 26.5%, you're going to text A. If you think it's about 13.5%, you'll text in B. If you think that's 7%, you'll text in C, and if you think that's about 4.5%, D. But again, you have to first text the letters UNCCN to the number 22333. We are very fortunate to have Tam Tammy Albert with us here today, and Tammy is a thoracic and sarcoma nurse navigator at the North Carolina Cancer Hospital at UNC Chapel Hill. She's served in this role for over seven years, as nurse navigator, Tammy is responsible for working directly with patients to ensure their journey before, during, and after the cancer experience and making sure that it's as smooth as possible. In 2012, Tammy received the Oncology Nursing Excellence Award for her unwavering compassion and caring for patients of UNC Healthcare. Let's take a look at that poll and see what you think. So, so far we've got 50% of our participants saying 26.5% uh, and, well, it just changed now. It's going back and forth, <laughs> <laughs> kind of like a race here. But, but we've got about half of, uh, of our uh, participants thinking it's, it's around 26%, about half at 13.5%, and, and now about 8% at, uh, thinking it's at 7%. So... Amy, what's the actual answer here? B. B. All right. So we're looking at 13.5. Um, All right. Thank you so much for responding. And part of our reason for asking you to respond to that poll is to help you to be ready for the other polls that will be coming. Uh, we'll have one a little further in this presentation. And then, as I mentioned, you'll be able to text in your questions at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over okay. to Tammy, who's the expert. There you go, and there's the mouse if you need that as okay. a pointer for anything. All right. So thank you for tuning in um, for caring with lung cancer patients. So the objectives are we're going to go over the different types and stages and diagnostic needs and treatment. We're going to review pathophysiology for lung cancers, the incidence and survival, risk factors, signs and symptoms, and the diagnostic test and screening. Then we'll go on to treatment options, side effect management, as well as an emotional impact and needs for patients. 
Um, and then we'll discuss the impact on the oncology nurse and the improvement outcomes and the quality of life of cancer patients. Then finally, survivorship for the lung cancer patients. So overall, there's two main types of lung cancer. There's your small cell, which responds to radiation and chemotherapy. However, it is very aggressive. Um, the malignant tumors arise most generally in response to repetitive carcinogenic stimulation, which a lot of these patients are smokers. Um, out of those that are out of those diagnosed with small cell, only 2% are ever non-smokers. So those that smoke are at highest risk. The, for the non-small cell, it accounts for about 85% of all cancers of the lung, and it's further divided into squamous cell, adenocarcinoma, large cell carcinoma histologies. They more or less share the identical treatment methods and prognosis but they have different histological and clinical characteristics and mutations. And we'll get into the mutations as we go along. So the first poll, oh, I hit it too fast. Oh, that's all right. We can go <laughs> ahead and go back one. All right, so here's that first poll. Lung cancer is a smoker's disease and happens only in older aged persons. And by the way, don't if you, if you saw any of the information <laughs> on that next slide, just disregard that. Sorry about that. All right, so we've already got uh, one person saying false. So if, if, you're in, if you believe that's true, just go ahead and send in one, two if false. And if you've already done the uh, UNCCN to 22333 once, that's all you need to do to get it activated. Now, if you go ahead and send a two, it'll answer as false. If you send a one, it will answer as true. And it looks like uh, we have a, a, a strong consensus <laughs> that that is false. And... Now we'll take a look at that answer again. Okay. Sorry about that. So as this shows you, you can guess, it's false. Not all, it is not a smoker's disease, and it happens to people of all ages. Bottom line, if you have lungs, you're at risk for lung cancer. So here's um, the incidence in survival. You can see on the screen that males are uh, the second most common type of cancers is lung, only second to prostate. And you can see the prostate is 21% of males where lung cancer is 14. In women, breast cancer is 29% and lung cancer is 13%. However, if you look at the deaths overall, for both males and females, lung cancer is the number one killer of all cancers. And I hate to say it that way, so I guess it's most lethal. Um, but it's 27% and 26% for females. Instance, of course, it increases with age. The majority of our patients are 65 years old or greater. But that does not mean that we don't have a lot of patients who are young as well. Um, Every day, 432 Americans die of lung cancer, and you can see on the, the grid, it shows you the leading cause of death with 157,000 um, patients diagnosed, or excuse me, lung cancer patients' deaths. And if you see, it, it's a great difference between the colorectal, which is the second one, of only 52,000. Um, only lung cancer is in 20.9% of current smokers, 60% of former smokers, and 17.9% of never smokers. It's the leading cancer of men and women of every ethnic group. And if you look at this screen, it will show you the federal funding um, for research. And this is really heartbreaking if you look. Lung cancer is the smallest amount, and this is by the uh, National Institute of Health research dollars per death. So every person that it passes away from lung cancer, the amount of research that goes in for that person is only about less than $1,500. Um, and if you go over the actual to the um, dark side, <laughs> I say it that way, but the dark side where it shows the disease types, there again, I mean, it's just mind-blowing how much um, money is needed for these patients per person's death versus how much that is actually allotted. So when it goes to screening, cervical cancer, of course, you can have the pap smear. And with the, uh, when they started doing pap smear, that had a greatest impact of 75% of deaths 
and cervical cancer patients. So they were able to diagnose it before it became an issue, before it became advanced. Colorectal cancer with a colonoscopy, it caused a 60% decrease in the incidence of cancer and 31% decrease in deaths. So um, they have been doing a lot of research since 2002 when we started doing the National Lung um, Screening Trial up until 2015 when they finally settled out on some lung cancer screening guidelines. So um, now if you are, have been a smoker, a former smoker, active smoker, we can get you into smoking cessation. Um, and also it puts you to where if you have a history of smoking, then you um, can have CT scans done, a low-dose CT scan, to be sure that we monitor and uh, recognize any changes in the lung fields. And this shows you the more of the guidelines from the NCCN, which is a National Comprehensive Cancer Network. If you have a history of smoking, radiation expo or excuse me, radon exposure, occupational exposures, cancer history, or a family of family history of lung cancer with first degree relatives, a history of COPD or pulmonary fibrosis, secondhand smoking exposure, and the absence of symptoms of lung cancer. Um, that is broke down into a, a larger category that gives more details. But if the patient is a, say they're a smoker and that puts them at high risk, this is only for ages um, 50 or greater that they look at this. Um, so if age 55 to 74 years old and they've been smoking greater than 30 year pack history, then they're automatically gonna be um, put into the CT screening program. The moderate risk, if they're 50 years um, and they've been smoking for 20 pack years, or they have a secondhand smoke exposure, which is a, a large amount, like if they're first degree, if they lived in a house with several people who were uh, smokers, or if they worked, say, in a bar where there was a lot of smokers, then that they still would not be at risk, but that would also make them be more aware. So maybe they could get their primary care doctor involved and monitor them. So if they did start showing changes, a cough, or they did a CT, excuse me, a chest x-ray for incidental finding or screening on an annual basis, they would know that they have that risk. So the risk of lung cancer, secondhand smoke. If you live with a smoker, you have a 24% increase in developing lung cancer than those that do not. Um, just think about when that person blows their smoke out, they're blowing out their carcinogens and the toxins and everything from the cigarette as well. Radon, radio, radioactive dust, um, that's usually in the mountains area, but it is found in the Piedmont um, and surrounding areas. You can get a small test kit from the um, health department um, and you just put it in a closet or somewhere where there's not a lot of airflow. And once it's been there, I believe it's two to three days, then you package it back up and mail it back to the um, the state and they will tell you if your home contains radon. Air pollution, genetic susceptibility, um, it just, we haven't really identified the patients who have a genetic marker that we can track for the diagnosis of, of lung cancer, but you can look at family histories, familial predisposition, hormone factors, um, a couple of years ago, they did find that hormones do affect the, increase the risk of lung cancer. So uh, young moms, we were having several uh, women who were popping up who were young moms who had just delivered or either pregnant that uh, found that they had lung cancer. Infectious factors, there's, you've got your TB, and then if you have recurrent infections, whether it's pneumonia or mycobacterium, that puts you at risk. Anything to irritate the lungs, um, the lung lining. Lung disease, COPD, um, is associated with four to six times the risk of a non-smoker. Arsenic and asbestos. Um, workers who do not smoke but have been exposed to asbestos do have a five times risk of developing lung cancer than non-smokers and occupational exposures, whether they are in paving, roofing, painting, chimney sweep, somewhere where they've been exposed to the toxins. 
So the symptoms of lung cancer. So you can, um, a lot of times patients come in and they are having a chest x-ray for a preoperative workup or if they've been in an automobile accident or it can be from anything that just brings them to the emergency room. That's usually when we find that the patient has a tumor or um, any type of changes in their lung that means that they need to be watched more closely. So the symptoms and signs of a primary tumor could be cough, hemoptysis, or coughing up blood. And that can be from just streaked amount of blood or tinged blood. Then wheezing, you can have pneumonia. Recurrent pneumonias um, could be from an obstruction in the airway. Peripheral tumors, if they have pain in the chest, um, rib area. They can have uh, shortness of breath and then a development of a pleural effusion, which means that you've got fluid that's building up around the lungs. Um, a cough. And then symptoms of regional spread is if the patient has superior vena cava syndrome. And that is where the tumor is compressing on the superior vena cava and it's causing the um, blood and the fluids to back up into the upper uh, chest and head area. You can have hoarseness from the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy um, and then lots of other nerve compression where the tumor actually just compresses on that nerve causing all these symptoms. You can also have, if they have, the patient has spread to the brains, so they can have confusion, um, difficulty ambulating, falls, um, and then with spinal cord compression, that can happen when they have numbness, tingling in the legs from where the tumor has metastasized to the spinal cord. So these are all advanced symptoms. So we're hoping we can find patients who have that cough with the initial uh, finding a, a tumor in their lungs so we can prevent a lot of these um, side effects and spread of disease. There is perineum plastic syndromes that can happen and there again, these can lead a patient to be diagnosed. They can have clubbing of their uh, fingers and fingernails, uh, SIADH, which is usually with um, small cell lung cancer, and this is when the sodium level is um, not being maintained properly in the body. So these are the different types of standard tests that we do for lung cancer. It can be an EUS, which is an endoscopic ultrasound. Um, that's where the pulmonologist will put a scope down into the airway and inspect the um, upper airways, the mediastinum, and the upper airways in the lungs. The pulmonary function test, that's where the patient will breathe into a machine and will test to see how um, forceful their lungs are to identify their pulmonary function volume, how deep their uh, breath can be, how much oxygen is carried in their, um, in their body. And then the bronchoscopy, and that, there again, that's done with the scope being put into the airway and they can get down a little bit deeper into the airway to get tissue to, for diagnosis. Um, if a patient has a CT scan and they've got a mass or a lesion that's in the outer part of their chest that can be um, reached with a CT scan, They'll, um, while the patient is under the CT scan, the uh, physician will put a little bit of numbing medication down and then will actually put the needle into the tumor while they're doing the CT scan. This way we can know we're getting directly into the tumor and getting a good chunk of tissue that we can do further testing on. And then the PET CT scan, that's where the patient is injected with a radioactive glucose um, and an hour after they've been injected, then they'll go into the scanner. And this shows where there's um, hypermetabolic activity. So a lot of times when there's a tumor and it's cancerous, the cell turnover is really rapid. So that will show the hypermetabolic activity. And it'll actually look what we call hot on a PET scan. So this shows you the timeline of treatment um, development with lung cancer. In 1969, there was only one single chemotherapy that was associated with a possible response. Then if you go to the 90s, then you can finally see where there's uh, three other medications that were introduced. So it was kind of a slow process, and then 
I would say over the past year is where we've had the most, year or two, we've had the most response, um, the most identif uh, rapid identification of treatment options. So you can see the doublet chemotherapy. Um, then we have the introduction of erlotinib or Tarceva. It is known to treat patients who have a um, EGFR mutation. EGFR means epidermal growth factor receptor. And that can be on any cell in the body. So when we have this um, cancer tissue that's um, retrieved from the person's body, pathology will actually do um, mutational tests on it to see if this patient has a positive or negative EGFR epidermal growth factor mutation. And if it does have the mutation, then the patient could go on just a pill for chemotherapy. A FATNIB has been approved um, in the past couple of years. And then now we've got to where we're using immune therapies. So nivolumab um, is one of the drugs that we use a lot of, and it's to stimulate the body's immune system to where it will identify and go after the cancer and hopefully resolve it out of the body. Seritinib is another one that we treat um, according to the mutation, and that is an out mutation. Um, the ROS1, Crizotinib is the drug we use for that. So there's a lot of, um, of new drugs, new therapies, types of therapies that have been identified over the past three to four years. This shows you, um, hopefully it'll show you a little bit better what I'm talking about when I'm saying mutations. So in 1990, we just knew that it was a cancer cell. We didn't know that there was any mutations. So then we identified that um, the cancer cell itself is divided up into several different types. It's the adenocarcinoma, the squamous cell, and then that little other, it could be a large cell. Um, and then out of those, we found the mutations or the target of therapies. So if you look at the adenocarcinoma, you can see we have the HER2, the MEC, a ROS1, a RET. Um, when these start coming down the pipeline, you kind of scratch your head going, where in God's name did they come up with these abbreviations? But um, it, we do have drugs now that identify that are treated to each one of these. Most recently, we had um, the RET drug that was identified. So now patients, when they, um, we get their tissue and we identify what type of mutation they have, they can go on this oral therapy. So there are some challenges when we try to get tissue or um, identify the mutations in second and third line treatments. So usually, um, a lot of times it's difficult to obtain the tissue from the patient or they have to go back and have another biopsy. Um, there's difficulty in making sure there's enough tissues uh, that we can do testing on. So sometimes we can actually do a liquid biopsy on patients, doing their, taking their blood and identifying if they have any types of mutations, um, whether it's the EG, mainly it's the EGFR, the epidermal growth factor. Um, and 30% of the um, patients in the um, trial that they did over to the side, um, they had enough tumor samples that they could identify these patients and actually treat them. So it's easier to draw blood out of a patient and send it off to have it tested than it is to obtain um, tissue for a second time just because of the risk. So this uh, slide, um, I just came up with it the other night and happened to think about it, and I thought, well, I'll add something to it. So you, the little stars are actually showing the um, drugs that we now have um, that can treat these mutations. So the ALK, the BRAF, and with a BRAF, if that cell or the tumor itself excretes a BRAF, we can usually treat it with a drug, um, an oral drug. So not all chemotherapy has to be through an IV. Um, HER2, EGFR, which I've spoke about, the MET, MEC, and RET, and ROS. So characteristics when we're making the treatment decision, of course, age can be the biggest factor, um, but we still, we can treat elderly patients with the same type of chemotherapy we do younger patients. Sometimes we just have to monitor the dose that we give them. But age, um, 
is the first treatment decision we do look at. Then comorbidities. Does the patient have um, other issues? Do, are they a diabetic? Do they have other type of lung disorders? Do they have um, inability to ambulate? Um, are they incontinent? So there's different things we have to look at overall for the patient. Their performance status. Um, performance status of a zero means that the person is up ambulating, independent, able to do what they like. A one is somebody who is able to get up, but they have a little bit of difficulty, whether they have fatigue um, or just not have the endurance. And then a, the performance status of a two is someone who is basically uh, laying around in the bed, inability to get up. Then we also look at, is it a male versus a female? Is it a squamous cell histology or a non-squamous cell? Do they have mutations or are the mutations what we call wild type? And that's mainly with the EGFR, epidermal growth factor. Are they a smoker or a non-smoker? And believe it or not, we even look if they're Asian versus they're not an Asian because the Asian population actually respond better to a certain drug that most Americans won't respond to. So this is, screen shows you the uh, lung cancer stages. So the stage one is when it's localized. That can be surgically excised without any difficulty. A stage two is if it's greater than five centimeters or has spread to local lymph nodes. So with those type of patients, after we do a surgical, exc uh, surgical excision to remove the tumor, then they will do chemotherapy along with the surgery. Stage three, they are locally advanced. And so these patients will get chemotherapy and radiation, and after they have the chemo radiation, then possibly to have surgery to remove the residual tumor. And stage four means they are advanced or metastatic. These patients will get chemotherapy plus or minus palliative radiation. By that I mean if it's palliative, if the patient is symptomatic, um, it's radiation is given for symptom control. If they have a tumor in the upper airway causing shortness of breath, then we'll give them radiation to that area as well. Surgical candidate assessment, it depends on the type, uh, excuse me, the size of the tumor and the location. How their pulmonary function is, are they able to take a deep breath and the, when I showed you earlier about the pulmonary function machine, um, or excuse me, pulmonary function test, are they able to expel enough carbon dioxide? Are they able to retain enough of the oxygen? Um, we will assess the FEV1 and DLCO, which is um, part of the lung function. They may have to have an exercise study to see if they can endure um, being up walking, what their tolerance is. Can they walk on a treadmill, or are they just able to um, maybe do a light exercise? And then we'll look at the perfusion scan, um, and that's a scan that is done to assess the airways, um, how deep breath they can take. And then the cardiac function. We want to be sure the person's heart is stable and strong enough to tolerate them having this surgery. So then radiation, radiotherapy in stage one and two. Remember, uh, stage one is one that can be excised. Stage two is one that can be excised and may or may not need radiation or chemotherapy with it. Um, while surgery is a beneficial, uh, most beneficial therapy, radiation alone has been used in patients that can't tolerate surgery. So if the patient has um, poor cardiac function or they don't have very good lung function, then we can do radiation um, or cyber knife therapy to that tumor. That way they can have it um, not really removed, but um, it can be irradiated to where it causes the cell death and they won't have any issues. Smaller tumors have better survival outcomes. There again, if it's a smaller tumor, then they can do um, an excision without having um, a lot of issues or side effects are delayed in recovery. Enlarged tumor cure is rare, but it can be controlled. Comorbidities influence survival rates. If a patient has diabetes or if they have poor pulmonary function or if they have a poor cardiac status, it will affect their overall survival. Um, radiotherapy has been used preoperatively, but um, 
with a little increase in survival benefit, so it's better if we can do the um, surgery to remove the tumor and then give it postoperatively. And cyber knife radiation can be done, it's when they, um, the provider will do a bronchoscopy and place these little gold seeds that are called fiducials. They'll put those into the tumor itself and then receive radiation. And the tumor, excuse me, the fiducials will um, more or less attack, have the radiation attached to it, and that way it'll get better uh, cell kill. Traditional dosing of radiation, um, it can be two-dimensional with a total dose of 60 gray. Clinical trials have been looking at going, uh, dosing up to 90 gray, which is a really high dose of radiation. The standard that we still use is still the 60 gray. However, it can go up to as much as 70 gray. Trials have looked at sequential or concurrent chemo rads with results showing concurrent has better outcomes. Sequential happens when it's one after another, and concurrent is when it happens at the same time. We get a lot of toxicities when it's done at the same time. Trials have looked at hyperfractionation, which seems to have better outcomes, and that's usually when the dose is given twice a day rather than only once a day. Um, and then the 3D radiotherapy is considered to have a new standard of care. It's higher, um, tighter fields and less toxicities. Radiotherapy is used to treat brain meds and pay, pay full bone lesions. A lot of times if um, a patient has small cell, then we'll go ahead and give um, whole brain radiation to that, um, to that patient, which is called PCI, or prophylactic um, cranial irradiation. Occasionally, radiotherapy can be used to treat pneumonias caused by tumors, and that's usually when there's an obstruction of a tumor that's causing the patient to be short, short of breath, uh, having a call for hemoptysis. And then stage four, radiotherapy is always palliative. In other words, it gives relief of pain. So radiation, uh, as far as nursing care, the patient, um, you'll need to go in and assess the patient and the family and make sure that they're aware of the true facts of radiation. Because there's a lot of the old wives' tales. Um, I actually have patients who come in and say that they can't be around their children or their grandchildren because they're going to be um, excreting radiation. So they can't use the same bathroom or they can't be even hugging each other. So you need to teach patients and families about their treatment plan, the appropriate side effects, assess for skin changes during radiation, be sure they're aware if they have redness um, or any wet redness in the area, that's usually the sign of a radiation burn, that they're letting the provider know or the nurse know immediately when they start seeing these changes. Um, early intervention prevents a lot of um, really nasty burns later down the road. Assess for esophagitis. When a patient's going through mediastinal or central part of their chest radiation, that's going to affect the esophagus. If the patient has esophagitis, they won't be eating or drinking as much, and it does cause extreme amount of pain. So you're going to also get pain management. And then you're going to assess the dietary intervention. Be sure the patient's getting enough fluids, they're, they're getting enough nutritional intake, whether they need supplements, and sometimes they even have to go as far as getting a um, peg tube or a G-tube placed, and that's just a small um, same-day surgery where they put a small tube into the gut so that way they can feed and get appropriate nutrition. So the non-small cell lung cancer guidelines, the diagnostic workup, um, we present our patients in a multidisciplinary conference. We have uh, feedback by the medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, uh, the surgeons, um, pathology, and uh, radiology. So we all get together and we discuss and review all these, um, the images, the tissue that's been obtained from the biopsy, um, and we discuss the appropriate um, treatment paradigm that we need to offer this patient. Then you have molecular profile, and that's where we look at the mutations of our patients. We also bring that in when we're discussing in the multidisciplinary group. Then the patient selection. We look at the, if they have an EGFR mutation or an out mutation. So if they have the EGFR, which is epidermal growth factor, 
then we're going to give them a first generation TKI or a third generation TKI. Both of these are drugs. Um, they're oral medications. Um, the Tarceva is the first generation TKI. It has side effects of rash. It can cause diarrhea. Um, the third generation EGFR drugs don't have as many side effects or are easily tolerated. With an outpatient, if they have CNS or a central nervous system disease, then we're going to look at oral drugs for them of crizotinib. If they don't have the um, CNS or central nervous system disease, then we'll look at possibly giving them crizotinib or one of these second generations of the um, ALK TKI. If they have a ROS1, a RET, there are different drugs, the crizotinib, cabosinib, I'm probably not saying that right, but um, with BRAF inhibitors, there is a combination of oral drugs that we use for that. Um, and then again, other actionable items, whether they have a targeted therapy, they may be on a clinical trial, we may give them chemotherapy and do immune therapy with them. And if the patient has no actionable alterations, then it will be standard chemotherapy or immunotherapy. So it's just a full spectrum of we kind of rule out or we look at what mutations the patient's tissue has uh, shown us that they have, whether it's the mutations or if they don't have a mutation, then we'll still give them a treatment, a standard chemotherapy or immunotherapy. We continue to, our treatment with the patient until there's a response or a response could be a progression of disease or it could be unacceptable side effects. If they have unacceptable side effects or they have progression of disease, then we're going to switch therapies on the patient. If the patient by this time doesn't have, we've not done complete testing of all the mutations, then we're going to go ahead and do a liquid biopsy or rebiopsy the patient. So here's another drug, um, that's another drug, another type of lung cancer, I apologize, mesothelioma. It's one of the rare types of lung cancer. It is an, effect, an aggressive type of lung cancer, and it affects the membrane lining of the lungs and the abdomen. It's less than 2,000 cases per year in the U.S., and most of these cases, 80% of these cases, are related to asbestos exposure. So those that have worked in the shipyards, um, who worked, um, some, we have one patient that worked with the submarines in the military, um, another one worked with the gunnery in the military. So when you have that exposure of asbestos, that's when the doctors, primary care physicians, or um, pulmonologists start watching these patients to evaluate to see if they have a risk of mesothelioma. There's no current cure for this. Um, there is a possibility of surgery depending on the amount of uh, disease in the lungs. And chemotherapy can help improve um, the outcome. Sometimes we can even do procedures like a talc fluoridesis, and that's basically where uh, the pulmonologist inject a talc into the lung, uh, the space in the lung, and it more or less burns the lung to where it sticks to the um, outside, and you don't have the ability for the, t the disease to grow in between the membranes of the lungs. So the outcome or prognosis is one to two years with treatment. Without treatment, it is very rapid. Small cell lung cancer, like I said earlier in the talk, um, it is more common with smokers. Less than 2% of the patients are diagnosed with small cell are never smokers. It's described in two stages. It's limited stage, which means it's confined to the chest or one area of the chest. If it's extensive disease, that means that there is spread outside of the chest cavity. It can be a brain mat. It can be um, found in the liver. It can be found in the adrenal glands. Limited stage um, is confined to the chest, and so that way we can treat it with radiation. If it's extensive disease, that means it's outside of one of the radiation ports, and that means the field of radiation. So with those patients, we will um, usually give chemotherapy up front. 20% cure rate for limited stage, and that is only if it's caught in the very early stages. Overall response rate is 50 to 75%. Untreated survival is six weeks. And if they are, have been treated with chemo, radiation, 
Um, right now, it's an approximated survival of nine months. However, no two patients are the same. Nobody knows how long anybody's going to survive. We just give them treatment and give them the best treatment options, um, overall survival as possible. This small cell is the most aggressive of all the different types of lung cancers. So if it's limited disease, we're going to do chemotherapy with radiation therapy. If it's extensive disease, we're going to do chemo radiation. The radiation mainly is going to be going only to the painful areas for pain management. The chemotherapy that we use is cisplatin. It's a platin, a heavy metal, so we've got to be sure that the patient is drinking plenty of fluids, is staying hydrated to watch the, um, the heavy metal or the platin out of the kidneys. It can also cause severe ch taste changes. I always encourage patients to get some type of lemon drops or something really like Altoids that's strong that will open up the taste buds and get the toxins out, get the chemotherapy out of their taste buds. So cisplatin is used with VP16 or can be used with a Renatecan. Those are two drugs, other drugs that we use to treat other types of cancers. We can also use carboplatin and VP16. There again, it's a platin, it's a heavy metal, but it's not as bad as a cisplatin. The cisplatin can really cause kidney damage. It can cause neurotoxicities. It, you can lose your hearing uh, with cisplatin. So it's always uh, imperative for the patient to make sure the provider is aware if they have any changes in their hearing. Um, so with limited stage prophylactic cranial radiation is recommended. If it's extensive, um, we use the cranial radiation or radiation to the brain for palliative use. If the patient has SVC syndrome, which is superior vena cava syndrome, um, I mentioned earlier, it's where the tumor is pressing on the superior vena cava. That happens a lot with small cell patients. So we use that radiation to shrink that tumor that will leave the side effects of the, um, the fluid and the blood being maintained in the upper airway, having a hard time getting down to the rest of the body. We also use it for brain meds and bone meds that are painful. And also we have clinical trials for small cell lung cancer patients. Um, there are not a lot of cl clinical trials for small cell, uh, number one because of the small amount of population, but it's very difficult to treat. So when you provide a nursing care to lung cancer patients, you want to optimize the quality of life. You want to make sure the patient knows their ways to control their side effects, um, if they can have proper nutrition. It's imperative to um, encourage your patients to drink small, excuse me, drink large amounts of fluids, small frequent meals. They can have just maybe a half a sandwich or a cup of soup every couple of hours. Anything as long as they're keeping food in their stomach. By maintaining proper nutrition, keeping food in their stomach, they're also going to prevent nausea and vomiting. Um, I always tell my patients, if you think about your stomach as a pot of boiling water, if you don't put food into that pot of boiling water, it's going to boil over. If you put food in there, it's going to die down and quiet down. So if we can get them to educate them early enough to keep the food in their stomach, then the side effects will be lessened. Adequate rest. This doesn't mean that they have to take naps every day. Um, it means that you, they should have a good either seven to eight hours, depending on what their history was before, as if they slept well at night or if they didn't sleep, sleep well. If they, some people don't require that much. But I always encourage them to sleep a minimum of seven to eight hours, take a nap one time a day, no more. And when they take that nap, try to not take more than a 30-minute nap. Low impact exercise also helps prevent uh, fatigue. Um, and if they're having difficulty sleeping, then discuss it with the provider and see if there's some type of interventions. Sometimes Benadryl, um, sometimes just using imagery. You can hear uh, the white noise machines. Things like that also help patients when they're trying to sleep. Managing pain and side effects. Uh, when starting pain medications, make sure the patients understand the side effects. Also, if they're having pain, they are not going to become addicted to their pain medicine. When there is a cancer patient and they're having pain, the, the pain receptors are going to be raw from whether it's the tumor or this treatment. So the pain medicine is going to go directly to those receptors. It's not like it's going to be sitting just in their body 
if it was like anybody else that didn't have any pain. So I always try to make sure patients know you're not going to become addicted. Don't fear the pain medicine. Fear the pain. Uh, we encourage patients to be honest with us about their pain so that way we can stay on top of it. They have a better quality of life and they get them to sleep better. They um, tolerate their chemotherapy better. Controlling anemia, we, also, we monitor their labs closely when they come in for, to see the physician before they get their treatment. We monitor their CVCs as well as other chemistry. Also, when the patient's coming in, we evaluate, are they have any shortness of breath? Have they been fatigued more than usual? Are they weak, more weak than usual? Um, some patients need physical therapy to intervene to teach them about how to ambulate safety, prevent falls, um, transferring from maybe if they're having weakness and they need assistance learning how to transfer from the car to the wheelchair or from the wheelchair to the bed. We always want them to stay safe. Emotional support, social support, um, and meeting the spiritual needs. Monitor for symptoms of depression. Um, there again, it goes back to if they're not sleeping well, are they not eating well? How is the family interactions? Encourage the families to attend the patient, with the patients on their physician visits, ask questions, offer support groups, um, and when you're evaluating the patient, identify if there's any signs of depression or depressive symptoms and get intervention. We have the uh, Comprehensive Cancer Support Program here at UNC. We have counselors so that if the patient starts showing um, they're having any signs of depression, we'll call in one of those counselors to come talk to the patient. Um, and in a non-threatening manner, and the patients are able to open up. If they want their family there, they can. If they don't, they just want to have that one-on-one, -on -one, they can have that as well. Um, a lot of times they're, they can help with just how to cope with a disease when it's a sudden onset. Educate patients and family about their treatment-related side effects. Uh, when they come in to the clinic visit and they're seeing the provider, ask questions to the patient as well as to their family. Are you sleeping well? How have you been? Are you able to get up and exercise? Usually if you ask those questions about exercise or endurance or how they've been doing, the patient will tell you one thing and the family will tell you another. Um, you just need to let them know they can tell you the truth. A lot of times patients are afraid to tell the truth um, about their side effects because they're afraid that you'll stop their therapy. So I always tell them that we can do things to alleviate the side effects if you tell us, but if not, then you know it can be dangerous in the long run. Hopefully we can prevent any unnecessary emergency room visits or admissions to the hospital if we can identify any side effects. Um, so now we're into oncology emergencies with lung cancer, and the biggest one that you've heard me talk about multiple times is the superior vena cava syndrome, or SVC syndrome. It develops in anywhere from 3 to 15 percent of the population of lung cancer patients. It's four times more likely to occur with patients uh, with right versus left-sided lesions. It can uh, be identified by facial edema or erythema, dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, cough, orthopnea, or a arm or neck edema. So sometimes the patients will come in, their arm will be swollen, and that'll be their only symptom. And they're, they'll give you this, um, sometimes the scenario, well, I'll lay it on that side. If you um, evaluate the patient more, you can see they have uh, vein distension in their neck and chest, um, and they can just have a real reddish appearance. And if they have those, then um, definitely need to be evaluated, whether it's a CT scan to evaluate the tumor itself. Um, sometimes these patients can't lay down. They have a lot of difficulty breathing when they change positions. And if they bend forward or stoop down, um, that also causes a lot of shortness of breath or just overall pressure. Um, Common findings um, are, is it, there again, edema of the head, neck, and face, the arms, dilatation of the veins of the upper body. You'll see their, um, the veins in their neck and across their chest sometimes will be more pronounced. Um, cyanosis of the face, periorbital edema, it'll be prominent. They'll have a lot of swelling, almost like their eyes are um, almost swell shut. Um, mental status changes, they can have confusion, um, and then 
Pleural effusion is more common when it's on the right side. Treatment for this is radiotherapy, chemotherapy. Um, it can be thrombolytic therapy or anticoagulation. Um, sometimes they have to have a stent placed to open the, um, uh, prevent the tumor from being compressed in the um, blood vessels. Angioplasty, and then the worst is when they have to have a surgical bypass because that will delay um, with them getting their chemotherapy. Most patients derive relief from obstructive symptoms just from getting uh, radiation or chemotherapy, and we can provide them with diuretics, which help get rid of the fluid, or steroids, which will help open their airways. Another um, emer oncology emergency is a perineoplastic syndrome, and that's usually where the patient will have significant weight loss or anorexia. We call that cachexia. Um, that means that they can not have an appetite, they have no desire to eat. Um, sometimes we'll uh, try to treat that with hormonal supplements, uh, steroids, and then sometimes herbal supplements. Um, for hormonal issues, which is SIADH, which means they have a very low sodium, um, it can cause nausea, vomiting, headache, weakness, confusion, um, cramping, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and then a very diminished amount of output, uh, urinary output, with increased thirst. It's very common with small cell. Um, a lot of times when patients come in with a diagnosis of small cell, I automatically start looking at their sodium level to see if we need to do anything to intervene, whether it's just uh, sodium supplements or restricting their fluids. That's really difficult for patients uh, when you restrict their fluids. Um, they get become very agitated because they have dry mouth and um, just want to figure out a way where they can get some extra fluid without it being known. Democycline is one of the medications we can give that will help treat the SIADH. Um, but with democycline, it's a real risk for the patient if they are outside because it puts them at risk for burns. We had a patient that was on democycline and just went outside, sat under an umbrella. She had on long sleeves, but it was thin material and long pants. And she ended up having a third degree burn over her legs and arms because of the sun. Uh, she sat out there for quite a while. She said that she had on sunscreen. Um, so you just have to do a lot of education with patients when they're on democycline to make sure they know to stay out of the sun. Another perineoplastic syndrome is hypercalcemia. That's when the calcium level is extremely high. It can be cause confusion. Um, it can lead to renal stones, slowed heart rate, anorexia. The next one is deep vein thrombosis or a blood clot in their leg. It can also go to their lung. Anemia, it can be common when you have advanced disease and it can be related to treatment. And then a white blood count elevation. Um, sometimes patients will come in even before they're diagnosed and they'll have a white blood count of 34. I've had one that um, was not too long ago that was up to 57. And usually if you have a patient who has elevated white count, we can monitor that to see if their treatment is uh, effective. If it is effective, then the white count will go down. Pericardial effusion or uh, pericardial tamponade is when there's a large amount of fluid that's accumulated in the pericardial sac or the sac around the heart. A range, amounts range from 200 to 1800 cc's. It can be caused from disease or from radiation to the heart um, or chemotherapy. Tamponade results when the heart is compromised and with an increased amount of fluid and the heart can no longer function properly, so it just is really struggling. Signs and symptoms, it depends on the amount of fluid. It can be fatigue, shortness of breath, cough, and it can be as much as severe distress, chest pains where the patients um, need emergent intervention. Um, and then the severe tamponade also can cause increased anxiety, restlessness, confusion, agitation. And the treatment for that is to drain the fluid um, and relieve the fluid pressure, sometimes by surgical intervention. Prole effusions, that's just the uh, fluid around the lungs. It can be excess sometimes. And with those patients, that need to have a pleurex placed, which is just a small catheter. It goes into the uh, cavity in between the lung. 
and it just continually drains off the fluids. Sometimes those fluids can be clear, sometimes they can be really thick. Um, the symptoms are shortness of breath, a dry cough, chest pains, uh, lowered blood pressure, and then ipsilateral shoulder pain or discomfort. This can become an emergent process when the patients are, um, have an increased amount of fluids that's causing decreased breath sounds. Sometimes you can hear a rub when you listen to their heart sounds, I mean, excuse me, their lung sounds. It's found uh, diagnosed with a chest x-ray or CT scan, and there again, treatment is draining the fluid off. Um, with the advanced patients, you have spinal cord compression, and that's where the disease has gone actually into the spinal column in between the vertebral bodies, and they're causing pressure directly onto the cord. So those patients usually have um, numbness, tingling in the arms, their legs. They have pain in their back, especially when they're laying flat. Um, and treatment of that is with radiation. Sometimes it has to be with surgical intervention to um, relieve the, the actual lesion from compressing onto the nerve, nerve base. So survivorship in lung cancer, um, it's a one, the one and five year survival rates for lung cancer are 44% and 17%. I would really like to see them be higher, but we're getting there slowly. Only 15% of lung cancers are diagnosed at an early stage with a five-year survival rate, and that's 54%. More than half of those diagnosed are at an extensive, extensive stage or metastatic. That means they're outside the lung, um, the chest, and those survival rates are 26% and 4%. The five-year survival rate for, non for small cell lung cancer is 6% which is significantly lower than the actual 21% of non-small cell lung cancer. So you see that lung cancer is very aggressive. Um, here's a slide that I've got other resources, which is UNC Cancer Lineberger, Lineberger Cancer Center. Cancer Grace is an interactive website so patients and family can ask questions with a medical professional that will answer those in real time. The North Carolina Lung Cancer Initiative is a support and a support group and we raise funds to fight um, lung cancer. We can supply grants for uh, researchers in the hospitals and also to raise funds for gas cars to help uh, patients get to and from their provider. This is uh, just a very special poem that uh, I've just it speaks volumes about lung cancer or cancer all over. Um, its cancer is so limited, it cannot cripple love, it cannot shatter hope, it cannot erode faith, it cannot eat away peace, it cannot destroy confidence, it cannot kill friendship, it cannot shut out memories, it cannot silence courage, it cannot reduce eternal life, it cannot quench the spirit. Tammy, thank you so much. That's a wealth of information, and I hope that all of our audience enjoyed that, and, and I'm sure they learned quite a bit from this today. I want to um, remind, we have just a few minutes for questions here, and so if you do have those questions, if you haven't already uh, texted UNCCN to the number 22333, do that now, and then you can go ahead and start submitting those questions. Uh, while we're waiting for a few questions to come in, I wanted to ask you, uh, what, what drew you to the field of oncology? And, and if you could tell us uh, the, um, you know, what, what brought you to this field. When I got out of nursing school, my, um, I went to work at a small community hospital, and it was a med surge floor. Mm -hmm. That was before they had the oncology units. So then we started getting more patients in, and it seemed I seemed to be drawn to those type of patients. They seemed to be patients that... They just appreciate everything you do for them no matter what. Yeah. So it kind of got in my bloodstream, and mm -hmm. I've not gotten mm -hmm. rid of it yet for 30 years, 31 years. <laughs> well, we're very thankful. What advice would you have to any members of our audience who are pursuing healthcare careers and, and may have that similar draw to oncology uh, through the, the exposure to lectures and patients and, and other information? What, how, how would they go? Uh, what would be the next steps for them? About, go out there, get research, look at mm -hmm. um, the different types of cancers, whether mm -hmm. it's um, lung cancer, breast cancer, 
whatever, pediatrics. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a uh, desire to make improvements, to make, um, to give help to people, mm -hmm. I would just go for it. Um, you know, if you've got the, a, a chance to even um, help out at hospice, if you want to go in and just be a volunteer with hospice or a hospice home, get your foot in the door that way. And that way you can see what these patients have received during their treatment journey. Right. And it will give you more desire to go back and give more. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? And I know we're running out of time here. Where, so wait just a few more seconds to see if any questions appear. And you're always welcome to submit your questions at our unccn at unc.edu email address. Uh, as we finish up here, I want to thank the University Cancer Research Fund and the North Carolina State Legislature for their generous funding of the Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center and uh, the UNC Cancer Network. We also want to thank the North Carolina Community College System uh, for their participation in this series and all of the community colleges that are participating. Uh, when we talk about the North Carolina Community College System, we specifically want to call out Renee Batts and Katherine Davis for, for their uh, all the generosity in terms of the, the time and commitment that they've given to making this program possible. We also want to thank the members of the UNC Cancer Network, Dr. Tom Shea, Mary King, Max Gaynor, Al Alan Brown, and Jean Sellers, who, who all are, are extremely dedicated to making this program possible. All right. With that, we want to thank you. Uh, we will have much more information available soon about a spring program and specific lectures for the, the winter spring for the community colleges, so look for that soon. Thank you so much for your time and, and your participation today, and we look forward to seeing you at a future lecture. Thank you so much.